Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Welcome to the Wednesday edition of Balance of Power. It's done. We just heard from the president a short time ago. You likely heard it on Bloomberg Radio. If you've been spending some time with us, the president signing the bill. This was a seven month long affair. Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, specifically the money over Ukraine was such a concerted debate, something the president spent so much time lobbying for. He actually signed all of this before he spoke to reporters earlier at the White House, making it clear that the package is already on the way. Here's the president a short time ago. I'm making sure the shipments start right away. In the next few hours, literally in a few hours, we're going to begin sending in equipment to uh, Ukraine for air defense munitions, for artillery, for rocket systems, and armored vehicles. You know, this package is literally an investment, not only in Ukraine's security, but in Europe's security, in our own security. We're sending Ukraine equipment from our own stockpile. From our own stockpiles. That's why this billion dollars in hardware was already set to go when the bill was passed. The president signed it. Get it out there. We've even heard from some military analysts on this program suggesting that there are staging areas closer to Ukraine uh, where the weapons and material were being held. The president there speaking from the White House with his U.S. and Ukrainian flag pin on his lapel. It's all about the numbers, though. If we can back up just a moment, what we saw in the Senate last night is certainly newsworthy. 79 to 18, the vote, that's the final vote. More voting for this than did in February, and specifically more Republicans. 31 voted for this bill compared to 22 who voted for the version back in February. As you might remember, that was the one without TikTok. This was supposed to be a heavier lift doesn't seem so much like it. Only 15 Republicans voted against it. Let's get into it right now with Jonathan Tamari, who covers Congress for us at Bloomberg Government. This day the president signs the bill, uh, Jonathan, I don't know what uh, you would have done with the last seven months of your life otherwise, but this was long in coming, and I wonder how you would frame this final vote in the Senate. Well, I'd say this is one victory and maybe one last victory, but a victory for some of the kind of institutionalists, uh, the internationalists in the Senate, and certainly within the Republican Party, a victory for uh, Republicans who are kind of more uh, molded by the Reagan era, molded by the Cold War. Um, the party's really been shifting away from them. It's continuing to shift away from them. But this is one last fight that they won, really driven by Mitch McConnell, embodied by Mitch McConnell, who considered himself a Reagan Republican, who came up yeah. and was a major figure or his built his career during the Cold War opposing Russia. And when you look at the vote, those Republicans who voted against it, very closely aligned mm -hmm. with Donald Trump. Many of them are very recently elected to the Senate, so a newer generation of Republicans are opposing this kind of thing. But it was one last time or possibly one last time uh, that that older generation of Republicans were able to prevail on this kind of issue. Yeah, there's one exception to that, of course, Jonathan. John Barrasso, uh, not mm -hmm. only a veteran, but the Senate Republican conference chair who wants Mitch McConnell's job. What do you make of that no vote? Well, Barrasso is probably the most Trump aligned member of the Republican leadership. Um, and so I think that's a bit of that going on there. He is now, I yep. think, seeking the number two job in, in that in that conference. And so he doesn't have the same necessarily political pressures as some of the others, maybe has a little more freedom because I think he's running actually unopposed for that position at this point. So definitely an interesting vote. He broke with other Republican leaders on it. But I think that's in keeping with him kind of. Even though he's of that kind of older era of Republicanism, uh, he's been more mm -hmm. aligned with Trump more recently. The Democrats joining Republicans in opposing this bill, one, not a big surprise, Bernie Sanders, uh, but Jeff Merkley as well. Peter Welch, uh, also from Vermont, like Bernie Sanders. This is all about Israel funding, right? They wanted to pull back on the weapons that we were sending. Not a surprise there. Not a surprise. I mean, I think it's one additional vote 
compared to uh, when they voted in February. I think Welch and, and Sanders were both no's back in February. So you have to pick up an additional Democrat. They are they do want to impose more um, more sanctions or I'm sorry, more restrictions on the way that those weapons can be used. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. you're seeing that even though that idea has spread to a significant part of the Democratic base, it's not reaching up into kind of the institutional establishment part of the party yet. Uh, there was a very small number of defections in the House from Democrats. And as we see last night, a very small number of defections in the Senate as well. Uh, so a major issue among maybe base voters and younger voters, but not so much the folks who are in office quite at this point. I don't know to what extent any of this is resonating on the campaign trail at this moment. Ukraine has its own influence, but there was a primary uh, yesterday, Jonathan, and I know you're covering this as well uh, with Pennsylvania always being close to your heart. Uh, on, as far as the top of the ticket here, Nikki Haley, a name yeah. that we haven't heard in quite some time, did awfully well. Uh, won more yeah, than 155,000 votes, 17 percent. That's a protest vote worth noting. What's happening in Pennsylvania? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at Pennsylvania, the last election, it was decided by 80,000 votes. And so that's, you know, half of the mark of what Nikki Haley got. And these are people there was no real campaign. So these are people who had, didn't have a lot of reason to vote and chose to come out and show their kind of protest against Donald Trump. And this is a closed primary. So these are only registered Republicans who are voting. So today that leaves mm -hmm. us with the question of, are these people who are registered Republican but have been voting Democratic for some time now? Or are these Republicans who are breaking away from Trump after his last election? And even if it's a small number that are Republicans breaking away from Trump, it could be meaningful. State was decided, as I said, by 80,000 votes last election, by 40,000 votes the election before that. So a tiny yep. margin of people could make a really big difference. And we've seen Trump really lose ground in the Philadelphia suburbs, lose Republicans who were kind of Bush, Romney, traditional Republicans. And uh, mm -hmm. when you're looking for every little percentage point, that's a warning sign for the, for the former president. Glad you could join us, Jonathan. It's great to see you, Jonathan Tamari, Bloomberg government. Look for his reporting on the terminal and online. We should note uh, that the president himself uh, was facing a bit of a protest vote. I guess we can call it that in Pennsylvania. Dean Phillips no longer in the race got 7%. We'll have more on the primary results and the results of the Bloomberg swing state poll coming up a little bit later on this hour as we continue our focus on the foreign aid package that the president of the United States just signed. This, of course, was not only Ukraine and Israel. It was also Taiwan. The Indopac component of this package got much less media coverage, much less attention, probably because it was less controversial. And it's something that we want to discuss with Max Baucus, the former senator and former U.S. ambassador to China, is with us right now. Mr. Ambassador, it's great to see you. Welcome back to Bloomberg. I'd like to just start more broadly here uh, with your foreign policy experience. The president uh, acknowledged the seven-month wait, the painful debate that preceded the passage of this uh, bill and the president's signature. What message did we just send to the world by waiting that long? Well, um, frankly, the, the good news is we sh uh, we're sending a message to the world that we can govern. Sure, it took a little while, but we got it done. Could have gone the other way. That package could have collapsed for one reason or another. It did not collapse. It passed. It passed a very large margin, the bipartisan margin. And that should give some comfort to Americans. We can we could govern, at least on foreign policy matters, and certainly a very strong message uh, to Europe on Ukraine. It's a very strong message worldwide and also to China. You know, China sometimes thinks that the, America, that the United States is in decline. This shows, no, no, we're not in decline. We're, 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 we know what we're doing. We're a little slow getting there, but we do get there. And we're standing by uh, our allies in Taiwan. This is a delicate situation, Ambassador. What does Beijing think about this package we just passed? When I was serving in uh, Beijing, the uh, Chinese drilled into me that Taiwan is a core issue. It's non-negotiable. Taiwan yeah. belongs to China. That's, it, it is totally non-negotiable to the Chinese. And, and that's the message that the Chinese gave to, uh, I think, General Austin just a short while ago. So we have to keep that in mind. And also remember, the United States does adhere to a one-China policy. The one-China policy says that there is one China. It's mainland China. It's Taiwan. 
we're not sure quite how that's going to happen. We are opposed to a, a military inf intervention. The United States is. Mm -hmm. We're also opposed to independence of Taiwan. It's very dicey, um, and and frankly, I think that both sides are know where the the the, the, the tripwire is. But both sides, however, are getting close to it. And I think we run a, a, a danger when we send a lot more arms to Taiwan. Most people in Taiwan don't like the status quo. They don't want change. They like it the way it is. They don't want independence. They don't want to be controlled by China. They kind of like the way it is. And I think the too few in America understand that really it, that is the view of the Taiwanese people. And I, I also don't think China is going to, enter, is going to military invade uh, Taiwan, not in the foreseeable future. Uh, why? Because Taiwan does not war, want war generally. U.S. doesn't want war generally. Mm -hmm. And President Xi cares about one thing, one thing only, that's political security. He sees what happened in Ukraine. He sees that Russia made a big mistake. They embarrassed themselves. Their generals were wrong. He, he's concerned about his PLA generals. Maybe his generals will not do for him what he would like them to do. He's very, very risk adverse when it comes to militarily invading Taiwan. Well, I'll tell you, Anthony Blinken is on his way as you know, Ambassador, and Bloomberg is reporting that the U.S. is drafting sanctions now, potentially sanctions against China uh, for doing business with Russia. He's set to deliver that message in Beijing, commercial support, to be clear, of Russia's uh, military production. How's that message going to go over? Well, first, it's good that the secretary is going to China. Uh, I think that more, he should go over more often. If you can, other cabinet secretaries should go over. We just need a lot more communication between U.S. and China. When I was serving as, as ambassador, secretaries came over very frequently. President Obama came over frequently. Um, now, under the current regime, there's less under Trump. Very few secretaries went over. So it's good that Secretary Blinken's going. I mean, he's facing a whole raft of problems and going over. Uh, that is, first of all, um, there's a message in the U.S. may sanction China for commercial aid, uh, not military aid, but commercial aid to Russia. Um, he's also going to probably address overcapacity, the problem that Secretary Yellen faced. And in, that, in, that, in addition to that, he's probably going to raise the problem with the Chinese um, trying to prevent aid to that, that, that sunken ship just off the, of the Philippines. He's going to have a hard time. The Chinese are going to give him a hard time. Yeah. Well, they uh, might want to give him a hard time about TikTok as well. Because every time we talk about working with China, we want to give them a hard time on something like this. Well, what do you make right. of this bill? I know that we're going to get into a big court fight here, Ambassador, but politically, what does this divest or ban order mean for our relationship? Well, clearly it's not good. Um, the, um, and as you, you're implying, this is yet to play out. Um, first, there's a question whether there could be a sale. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult. Oh, for sale to occur because any purchaser looking at uh, buying TikTok from um, from ByteDance is going to see that the Chinese government does not want to sell the algorithm, which means the value of TikTok is very, very low. It's not, it's not going to work. But second, um, you know, there's all the problems of, of banning the app. Um, the people will get around it, countries will go to various countries. It's, it's just not an easy thing to do. And as you're saying, it, it's all going to be resolved in the courts. Basically, I, I think that um, uh, this, this, it's, it's a huge problem. It, it raises another issue, frankly, and that is the, the, the partisan politics of the United States against China. And it's felt well understood. Clearly, we want to protect our national security first. That's first and foremost over any, everything. The trouble is national security is being used somewhat as an umbrella to cover lots of other interests, not just national security, but commercial interests. And, you know, you know, I'd like to know where the, what, where the beef is. Often the United States government says, well, China might do this, might do that. Well, it might, but where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? Where's the beef? One problem I have is, um, to, to a large degree, all the U.S. governments have to say China. Well, doesn't have to provide any evidence, just China. And that's enough to cause people to get all upset and say, oh, no, we've got to do something against China. I raise all this because we're going in the wrong direction. Um, that is a greater divide between the two countries. Both countries are rearming more and more, and that's not a good direction. We should be figuring out ways to go in the other direction. We're, we Neither country is doing a very good job at all in trying to figure out how we work better together. Ambassador, I'm out of time. I don't want to set you up to cut you off here, but in our remaining 30 seconds, should Speaker Mike Johnson visit Taiwan now that this has passed? No, he should not. Speaker Pelosi should not have gone over. Uh, Johnson should not go over. Um, let's just kind of let things cool off a little bit. 
um, there are ways to show our support for Taiwan, but don't rub uh, Speaker Johnson. Don't rub the nose of the Chinese. Speaker Johnson should not go over it. Yeah. It's great to have you back, sir. Come see us again soon. The former ambassador to China, the former U.S. Senator Max Baucus, getting us rolling here on Balance of Power. It's the Wednesday edition. The bill has been signed. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Good reminder that earnings season is underway, and certainly that is driving a lot of the market action. But so too, Joe, does the economic data. We're going to get a bunch more of it this week, including GDP tomorrow, which is expected to show still robust robust growth in the United States mm-hmm. of 2.5% after the prior reading of 3.4%. This economy still, by and large, hanging in there. Right. The problem for President Biden is... He's certainly not getting credit for it, and people don't think it's as good as the data may suggest. Well, yeah, we have to note, uh, I realize the pain that's involved with going to the grocery store and more recently, again, the gas station, but we Mm -hmm. have to note the data are so strong that the Fed has had to move its plans to cut interest rates. And you would think that that might be a strength that is enjoyed by more people than we're seeing in this new Bloomberg swing state poll, Kaylee. It's not just those who think the economy is a problem now, but the lack of optimism of the economy moving forward is a huge problem for this president. Yeah, only 23% of respondents said the unemployment, the employment rate would improve yep. over the between now and the end of the year, exactly. which is suggesting they don't have better prospects necessarily for the job market. They actually expect the conditions to get worse, not better. And therein lies the rub. Among uh, undecideds, it's single digits Mm -hmm. who are optimistic that that uh, number is going to improve, Kaylee. So we've got a lot to unpack here and a couple of important voices to help us with that. We'll be joined in a moment by Eli Yokely, political analyst with our partners at Morning Consult that helped to run this poll. And right now, our conversation uh, with Laura Davison, Bloomberg News politics editor, who's deeply involved in the poll here. Laura, great to see you. Have we isolated the biggest areas of concern for Joe Biden here, issue number one remains the economy. The economy and within that inflation still Mm -hmm. continues to be the issue that people are saying that they think is not gonna get better. You know, we did see in the past month some data for inflation that was a little Mm -hmm. less encouraging. Uh, The Fed pushing back any rate cuts, uh, you know, borrowing costs continue to be an issue that people cited in this poll. And, uh, you know, by and large, uh, the the bump that he got from the State of the Union last month has all but disappeared in this month's poll. Uh, So that's Mm -hmm. not great for the president, you know, particularly in uh, those those Sunbelt states, Arizona, uh, North Carolina, Georgia, um, you know, in some cases, you know, uh, you know, spreads looking close to 10 percent, which is, uh, you know, a big gap to make up, even though he has some time. Well, it's interesting to consider how things have changed since the student state of the union address. Maybe it got better for a period and, and now has fallen off. He outlined a bunch of things in that address he gave back in early March, including changes he'd like to see to tax policy and the like. And it's interesting when you look at some of the other aside from the top line of the polling we did down into things like who ultimately should be taxed to save Social Security. A lot of people in these swing states think, yeah, tax the billionaires. Save our welfare. It's really incredible how much support there is for a billionaire's tax. You know, the 77% of of swing state voters in this poll said that they would support a a billionaire's tax to fund Social Security. It's interesting. We polled last month on just the popularity in general of a billionaire's tax. It was, you know, about 70%. So people love a billionaire's tax. And when you ask them if they want it to pay for Social Security, they love it even more. Mm -hmm. Of course, the the, the political challenge of this is, you know, about half of Congress is opposed to a, a billionaire's tax, if not a little bit more. You know, all of Republicans and a handful of Democrats in some cases. So, uh, you know, this is really the disconnect where you see, you know, what the American public wants and what uh, Congress can get done. And that will be the challenge, uh, you know, in the coming years. How do you years. rationalize that among Trump supporters, a self-professed billionaire, whether or not that's actually true? He's making the lifestyle of a billionaire look pretty good for them, right? And they think that he ought to be able to pay his attorney's fees with small cash donations instead of spending his own money. Those same voters support a billionaire's tax. 
How does that work? It's it's a really interesting disconnect, and we've seen a shift in the American public. You know, in the past, you know, decade or so, of you know, wanting more taxes um, on the wealthy. You know, even yeah. you know, Donald Trump's tax cut in 2017, um, it was the first tax cut to be politically unpopular. You know, Bush did a bunch of tax cuts in the, in the 2000s, all popular. But we've seen this shift of you know, you know that people seem to think that the, the, the wealthy should pay more. Mm -hmm. How you square that with you know Republicans also wanting Donald Trump to be able to tax mm -hmm. tax political money for his legal fees, I couldn't even begin to tell you. Well, on the subject of Trump's legal battles, it's also worth pointing out tomorrow is the day the Supreme Court's going to hear arguments in his immunity right. from prosecution uh, case or the case he's making that he should be immune from prosecution here in Washington. Today, though, Laura, the co court was dealing with another issue related to abortion, specifically in emergency cases in Idaho. And yet it speaks to this wider issue of abortion that continues to rear its head in the legal system and in a number of states. And this poll was conducted including in the swing state of Arizona after the abortion ruling there, which reinstated a law from the Civil War era or essentially said it could be enforced. How did we see that showing up? So across uh, all party IDs, Democrats, Republicans, independents, abortion has ticked up as, a, as an issue that is very important to voters, You know, particularly among Democrats, particularly in Arizona. We saw that most acutely. But having these headlines you know, about you know, IVF in Alabama, mm -hmm. having the Idaho uh, headlines, having you know, Florida now being a, uh, you know, potentially the Biden campaign thinks in play because of the abortion referendum on the ballot there, um, this is you know, only continuing to be more important to voters. And Democrats are really banking on this as being an issue that will turn out voters in what is otherwise, uh, you know, political experts are projecting as a lower turnout election that we've seen for the past several cycles. All right. Bloomberg Politics Editor Laura Davison, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. So, Joe, maybe it is partially about abortion, but our polling would indicate largely it still is the economy stupid as yeah, we hear that's right. so frequently. And that's a message the White House is going to have to counter. And someone from the White House, Gene Sperling, who's an advisor to the president, used to run the National Economic Council, was talking about that on Bloomberg Television earlier today. And this is what he said to push back on that narrative. I think overall there's been lots of evidence that people are starting to appreciate more of the positive things in this economy. When people have gone to the polls, when they've, when they've actually voted and had a chance to register their unhappiness, like in 2022, what happened? It ended up being a historically positive election for this president. So for more on the issue of the economy and what we're seeing in our polling, we turn now to Eli Yokely of Morning Consult, where he is the U.S. politics analyst. It's, Eli, it's always great to have you on poll day. Happy poll day, as we call it here at Bloomberg. When we look at what we're seeing in terms of the feeling around the economy, knowing that it is currently April, there's still six and a half months to go until the election. At what point are views around the economy solidified enough that there is nothing that the Biden campaign is going to be able to do to change minds? I mean, one thing that stood out to me as I was reviewing some of this data is this is the first month in a while when voters across the swing state map, more voters than the month before had said that they see prices as increasing. We've done this now uh, for seven months in a row, and we're basically back to where things began in terms of how voters are perceiving inflation. And, you know, that's worse in these states where President Biden is doing the worst, places like Nevada, places like North Carolina and Arizona. Um, clearly, that is weighing on the president's uh, reelection prospects in a, in a big way. This is always voters' number one issue. Um, and, and even if you ask them to pick one issue, the economy is up there. Uh, this is going to be a problem the Biden campaign is going to have to deal with. They're going to, you know, we've seen some of the Democratic strategists argue this, that Biden needs to stop trying to sell Bidenomics and meet voters where they are and, and acknowledge the price is increasing. Uh, th this, is, this is obviously a problem for him. And until he addresses it, it's probably not going to go away. So much of this has to do, Eli, with expectations. Fewer than one in five say they think inflation uh, will come down by the end of the year. Only 23 percent think the unemployment rate will improve. Does this indicate that there's a potential for massive upside for Joe Biden when expectations are so low? I mean, that's kind of the uh, the Joe Biden campaign trick, right, is let people think things are going to be really bad and then outperform it. He did that with the State of the Union. People didn't think he could get through a speech that late at night, and he crushed it in their minds, right? Uh, you know, yes, I think that is possible. Yeah, 
Voters aren't afraid of losing their jobs. I mean, we've asked that every month. That's not a big concern. Obviously, it's this prices problem that he's dealing with. The one upside here that we've noticed this month in a bigger way than we had in previous months is the economy as a top issue has declined a bit. Other issues have taken precedence. Now, one of those is kind of bad for the president. That's immigration. This is an issue that Republicans have always had an advantage on and are very, very good at weaponizing against Democrats. The other one is abortion. And we saw this wave of, in this wave of surveys, an increase among the voters who say their number one issue is abortion. Um, that seems like it might be a bit of an out for President Biden, especially in Arizona, by the way, one of the places where he's doing the worst. Uh, the economy is almost tied with immigration, but abortion doubled since we started doing this. And a lot of that movement happened after that state's Supreme Court put in that Civil War era law that, uh, that, that, ban most abortions in the state. So uh, that, that's a long way of saying the economy is something that people are dealing with. It's a big concern and it makes them unhappy with what they're seeing in Washington. But as this campaign unfolds over the next several months, there's going to be moments in places like Arizona and other places where other issues take prominence. The question for, the, for President Biden is going to be, when is that? Is it at a beneficial moment toward the end of the campaign? Or at moments like this, when voters might get used to what they what they're seeing. All right, Eli, as you talk about the issue of abortion and how the Arizona Supreme Court weighed in on that, the Supreme Court, the actual high court in the United States uh, here in Washington, was dealing with the abortion issue as well in a case today. Tomorrow, they'll be dealing with a case involving Donald Trump and his immunity of, from prosecution uh, argument. When we think about Trump and, and how his legal battles factor into voter opinion in the swing states, I know we've asked this question before in our polling, uh, didn't this time around, but how should we be thinking about as we see him in court in New York, where he'll be back tomorrow, as we see the Supreme Court taking up these questions, as we deal with the possibility that he could very well end up a convicted felon in the next month or two, how is that likely to change what we're seeing in the polling? I think that the way the American people are thinking about this election, uh, you know, the, the the abortion issue is a big deal. People, what prices people are paying is a big deal. But these two individual characters, I think, are the biggest deal. People know where they stand on the policy issues. But you have questions about President Joe Biden's age, almost a senility question. And then you have questions about Donald Trump's uh, alleged crimes, the criminality question, the if, Earlier pieces of this for the former president were not breaking through in a massive way uh, when they were coming down, especially some of the federal cases that are coming. Now that the American people are tuning into this over the coming months, we're going to need to watch how they react to this and how much of this breaks through versus how much of how people think about Donald Trump's criminality is already baked in. I think a lot of the American people had uh, understanding of where they were on that question after after things like January 6th or after all of the things we went through in Trump's 2016 trial, uh, his 2016 election. Um, but he was not on trial of it. He, he was never convicted by a jury of uh, average folks in a way that it's possible he will be this year. That could be an inflection point if it comes. Uh, the, look, the day-to-day -day trial stuff, we'll see how much that breaks through. That doesn't seem like the kind of thing that is going to be that compelling to the American people. There's no cameras in the courtroom. All it is is Donald Trump standing out in the hallway talking for a minute, and then they move on. The bigger deal will be if Donald Trump faces a conviction. That is a defining moment that probably would weigh on the American people. Spending time with Eli Oakley at Morning Consult. Lastly, Eli, we saw, and it may not be a big surprise, but concern about geopolitical issues, namely Israel, fall to single digits in this poll. As so many people talk about a protest vote in the primary trail uh, for Joe Biden, is this something he needs to worry about in the swing states or not? I, I think that this is an issue where the president has sort of evolved a bit. And it's one where the American people have evolved too. I mean, it's not top of mind for voters, but it is one where there are big inflection moments that stick out. And we saw this in earlier iterations after some horrific hospital bombing or after um, the Hamas attack on Israel. Uh, the American mm -hmm. people 
do you see it when something big and dramatic happens? But but look, Israel's losing the PR battle. Here. Donald Trump said that, and he's right. I mean, we're seeing this in all of our data. Israel has is losing the PR battle among the American people. The American people seem tired of this war. They seem yeah. to be sympathetic with the Palestinians, or at least both sides equally. And in our national data, mm -hmm. they've got a lot of questions about sending money to Israel after what they've seen unfold right. over the Past Which is months. pretty important on a day like this when the president actually signs the bill to send the money <laughs> and the support. Eli, it's great to have you back. Eli Oakley walking us through our monthly drop here in the Bloomberg Morning Consult Swing State Poll. We'll talk to you in a month, Eli. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. I'm Kaylee Lines alongside Joe Matthew here in Washington, broadcasting live on Bloomberg Television and Radio on what is not just any Wednesday, Joe, but it is poll day. Yes. Where once again, we have a look at the seven swing states likely to decide the outcome of the election. It's not looking good for President Biden. He's losing in all but one of them, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is something that has not just domestic implications. We consider whether it's going to be the current president or the former president who is president in 2025. But it has implications for U.S. allies and adversaries and our partnerships all around the world as well. That is for sure. With questions about what makes this administration different than mm -hmm. the last one. When it comes to some of our relationships, China's the big one we hear a lot about. Yep. Tariffs are still in place. Another one that is curious is Cuba. And we have a unique opportunity to speak with the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Republic of Cuba right now. Carlos Fernandez de Cosio is joining us from our studios in New York. And it's great to see you, Minister. Thank you for being with us today on Bloomberg. I had the pleasure of being in Havana in 2019 for the rededication of the Hemingway House. At that time, I got an earful about the different policy, the different relationship that the Trump White House had with Cuba than the Obama White House. That relationship has not changed meaningfully since Joe Biden was elected, has it? I agree with you. There has been changes in the sense of few areas that the U.S. government has decided are of benefit for the U.S. and are of benefit for Cuba. Cooperation, for example, in law enforcement, in areas of science, technology, health, some academic. But the meaningful part of the relationship, which is the economic blockade and the, the aggression against the Cuban economy, has not changed. It's been faithfully applied by the Biden administration. So is the outcome for Cuba, sir, the same regardless of who wins? in November of this year? Or do you fear that there could be even more intensified policy under a second Trump administration when it comes to things like sanctions and potential economic ramifications for your country? Like most people, we can't guess who's going to win the elections. And it's very difficult to truly understand what they promise and what they're going to do. What we hope or what we look for is that whoever wins does not uh, apply more restrictions for, for example, for Cubans that live in the U.S. to re relate with their families and their country of origin or for business people to have even more limitations to do business with Cuba. We would hope that perhaps they ease them or lift them. Or for Americans to travel. They are prohibited to travel to Cuba in almost absolutely. Perhaps they will give the Americans the freedom to be able to travel as they travel to other countries. That's what we hope. What do you... What do you hear from the U.S. when it comes to Cuba's relationship with Russia? Because this is something that is obviously considered a very delicate matter uh, here in Washington. The fact that Russia is investing in Cuba, the fact that Russia, in fact, drafted some Cubans apparently to fight against Ukraine. Is that the point of friction between Havana and Washington right now? The U.S. government knows that most of the investments that take place in Cuba are from European countries or Canada not so much from Russia. And they also know that we were the ones that I, uh, uh, learned and made public that a few Cubans that were in Europe were being recruited for the war. And uh, we took measures for those that were attempting from Cuba to also travel to the war. And we've learned that there are people on both sides, both in Ukraine and Russia of Cuban origin, most of them recruited in, Ru in Europe, not in Cuba. Well, sir, considering people who are of Cuban origin brings us to the wider question around migration. I know you and your government have been involved 
in talks with the U.S. on the issue of migration specifically. Is that an area where where progress is being made? Can you just characterize for us how that effort is going? That's an area in which the U.S. government and Cuban government have been able to manage, regardless of the administration in, in the White House, for decades already, with ups and downs. At this moment, we have agreements in place that we implement and issues on which we discuss that put a limit to the uncontrolled flow, which is what we try to cut. But we made it very clear that as long as the U.S. has a policy of making life difficult for Cubans, it is logical for them to want to migrate to a more pro prosperous economy. Above all, if there's an invitation to the, by the U.S. that they will get a privileged um, treatment if they reach the border of the United States by whatever means. So what is the next step? What are you asking for from Washington? When you talk to the administration, when Havana engages with Washington, what could Joe Biden do now to begin thawing this relationship with such a close neighbor? What we're not doing is we're not asking for aid or preferential trade conditions or financial Understood. support. What we're asking is to be left alone, to allow Cubans to try to develop economy, to try allow us to put in place the transformations that we, ident we have identified that are needed to push our economy forward and not make life difficult for the people of Cuba. Well, sir, and you alluded to the idea that you think the extent of the migration we're seeing from Cuba may have to do with the difficulty economically of what life in Cuba actually looks like. But is there really nothing your own government can do on your side in terms of civil liberties, for example, that may also play a role in stemming that tide? Uh, civil liberties is not the main issue. Most of the experts from U.S. and Cuba who follow migration would, would say that. It's basically a, an economic migration. But I, w I do grant that every country has problems in economic policy and uh, the, the, the in discomfort of people with political situation. It happens in all of Latin America. It happens in the U.S. I'm sure that if you poll people here in the U.S., not everybody's happy with the government. Not everybody's happy <laughs> with the economic condition. But what's extraordinary, what's unique, is that the most powerful nation in the world has a policy specifically determined to make life as unbearable as possible for the population. And so it's in the hands of the United States to tackle that. It's an illegitimate approach. So the rest we can deal with, but this extraordinary uh, factor has to be dealt with by the U.S. government. Minister, there was a visit by Sergei Lavrov, uh, Russia's foreign minister in Cuba at the time of Alexei Navalny's death. That is a story that resonated uh, very loudly here in the U.S. It's one that the Biden administration took a very strong stand on when it came to Russia's handling of Alexei Navalny. Did Havana have a message for Moscow when it came to Navalny's death? We have a close relationship with China, with Russia. And there's no, uh, it's not surprised that to have visits of our ministers. But Navalny was not part of our agenda. All right, Deputy Foreign Minister of Cuba, Carlos Fernandez de Cosio, thank you so much for joining us, joining us, of course, today from New York. We appreciate your time, sir, spent on Bloomberg Radio and television. And interesting to hear from him, Joe, the idea that maybe there isn't for Cuba mm -hmm. much difference between a Biden administration and a Trump administration in the policy that we've seen under each, but there are serious areas where that Venn diagram does not overlap as much on mm -hmm. things like tax policy, for example. What was done under the Trump administration back in 2017 in terms of tax cuts, not right. similar to the efforts that we have seen Biden at least outline if he hasn't even uh, necessarily proved successful on his ideas of taxing millionaires and billionaires at sure. higher rates and the like, but there's a difference. There. Uh, but there's a big difference, and sometimes that's what you're actually able to get done, to your point, than yeah. what you're actually uh, uh, professing to do. And it's, uh, it's an interesting situation that we find ourselves in and one that we wanted to talk about with the former chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. See, Kevin Brady's coming to talk to us today. The former congressman from Texas is with us. It's great to see you. Kevin Brady, welcome back to Bloomberg. There's so much we'd love to talk to you about. And before I get to tax policy, I know Kaylee wants to go there as well. I just would love your thoughts on what just happened in your former House of Representatives after seven months of pushback this new Speaker of the House managed to pass bills to fund our allies in hot wars around the world. The president signed it today. What does that say about the status of Mike Johnson as Speaker? Well, Joe and Kaylee, it's great to see you again. I love being on balance of 
power. So I think, you know, Speaker Johnson, you know, made a commitment for a very strong America, projecting our strength around the world and keeping us safe for the longer term. He found a way uh, to find common ground and, and cobble together, not just key priorities for our allies and us rebuilding our military strength as well, but found a way to to uh, uh, find common ground on how we seize Russian uh, assets and help pay for uh, the, the eventual rehabilitation of Ukraine. So, you know, I think it was a masterful job, uh, shows uh, he is a Ronald Reagan conservative uh, and seeking to lead his house under difficult situations the very best he can. Mm. Well, sir, it's interesting as well that this is not the only thing we've actually seen be able to get through the House with massive bipartisan uh, votes for it. That also happened with the tax package that passed the House. It's very unclear what will happen in the Senate. So we want to get to you on the subject of taxes now, considering we can announce today that you're now strategic advisor for the Alliance of Competitive Taxation. I'm sure there's a lot you want to do in this new role, sir. But what about the tax issue that already is currently sitting in the Senate. Do you have any real hope that that bipartisan deal that would include tax breaks for businesses, expand the child tax credit, will actually get through well, in this Congress? Or is this something yeah. we're not going to deal with until 2025? So I think uh, we're all hopeful. ACT is a nonpartisan, really policy-focused group of tax directors from 48 of America's leading companies. And these are companies that hire millions of workers, have lots of small businesses, mid-sized businesses that depend on them, but they compete around the world each and every day against China, Europe, and foreign competitors. So they have a great deal of insight for policymakers, Republican or Democrat, on these issues. They are supportive uh, of the package, as I understand, mainly because you know, the business provisions within that um, uh, within that package helps them compete, drives research, new equipment, technology here in the United States. I think, you know, they're all hopeful uh, that perhaps uh, they can find common ground sooner rather than later. Congressman, uh, in, in your new capacity representing business interests here, you're going to be attempting and working uh, to preserve the uh, 2017 tax cuts to make them permanent. And we've got a new poll out today, and I wonder what your reaction to this is. This is D's and R's. 77% of registered voters in the seven swing states that we are tracking. 77%. There are not a lot of issues where we can get a number like that. Support the idea of a billionaire's tax to pay for Social Security and other entitlements. How do you have both when you're trying to extend the 2017 tax cuts? Could we also see a billionaire's tax in America? You know, I don't think it's like that. I'm, I'm always surprised those polls aren't at 100 percent because who doesn't want to tax millionaires and billionaires? But the truth of the matter is, you know, what taxpayers are are hoping for, then 2025 Congress, both parties will come together to extend, you know, those middle class and personal tax cuts, the tax cuts for small business. that are so critical and then extend the business provisions that have allowed American companies, small or large, to compete around the world and win and bring their profits back to invest in America. ACT, um, which is this coalition, is focused on providing research and policy ideas to mm -hmm. Congress on issues like how do you make sure America is the very best place to invest and create new jobs? How do you make sure American companies can compete and win anywhere in the world, especially when China is so publicly targeting our American mm -hmm. industries. And finally, they want to incentivize more research and innovation in the U.S. because, as you know, the country that wins the innovation race really wins the future. And so these are policy, these policy ideas that I think Republicans and Democrats are both vitally interested in. Well, Congressman, how do you make sure these policy ideas, though, are also fiscally responsible? Because as much as the Trump tax cuts of 2017 may be heralded for the impact they had on businesses, we also saw trillions of dollars added to the federal deficit. If you're not getting as much revenue, but you're still spending a lot, that isn't exactly the kind of equation you want to see for deficit reduction. So what's the responsible way to pursue this? Yeah. So one, I think one that didn't add trillions of dollars. Uh, to the debt. That's been fact-checked uh, as misleading, even though the president continues to uh, to claim that. In fact, the corporate tax revenues, which were initially criticized, we're now generating more for the U.S. government at 21 percent tax rate than we were at 35 percent corporate tax rate. And why? Because we're growing the economy uh, uh, from the business community 
increasing workers' paychecks, drawing um, investment and new jobs back to the United States. And so what I do think is uh, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle will be looking for ways to offset some of those taxes. And I will tell you, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you know, we didn't uh, have one and a half trillion dollars of taxes. We had five and a half trillion dollars of tax reform. You know, we made major changes to the tax code to simplify it, make it more fair, eliminate provisions for some so we can lower taxes for everyone, middle class families, working moms, small businesses and the like. And I think you'll see lawmakers taking much the same approach in 2025. All right. Former Congressman Kevin Brady of Texas, thank you very much for joining us here on Balance of Power and congratulations on the new role. Again, he has joined the Alliance for Competitive Taxation as we finished one battle in Congress this week, (laughs) Joe, over funding, over the supplemental. It just reminds us there are still many battles ahead, including on tax policy. That's why we're here every day on Balance of Power. (laughs) We need to get Kevin Brady in studio. Uh, Congressman, when you're back in Washington, come see us. With Kaylee Lyons, I'm Joe Matthew. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.